So my name is Kent Bai, and I do the Voices of VR podcast. And today I'm going to be talking about the state of XR privacy and some conceptual frames around how I think about privacy. So I do the Voices of VR podcast. I've been doing it for over seven years now and recorded about 1,600 interviews. And I'm coming up here on episode 1,000 here within the next month or so. All right, so back in 2019, I went to the Future of Neuroscience in VR. It was a conference put on by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and it was an opportunity for different neuroscientists to give updates to the latest and greatest as to what was happening in neuroscience. And they, they showed this synthetic speech generated from brain recordings. And so what you have here is this ECOG. This is an invasive technology, ECOG. And the ECOG is listening to what you're thinking, and then it's translating that into how you would speak. But it's essentially able to decode what you're thinking. The proof that you're seeking is sign available in books. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. So again, this is just taking what you're thinking. This is an invasive technology, but what the neuroscientists said is that within the next five to 10 years, the artificial intelligence and just the FNIRS technology is gonna get good enough so that you can basically wear this device on your head and it's essentially gonna be able to read your mind. And at F8 in uh, 2017, four years ago, Facebook announced that they're going to be doing a BCI, brain computer interface, so that you could think and be able to type with your brain. But then the question becomes, well, if you're thinking and Facebook has a device in your head, then what happens to that data? And how can you make sure that they're not just going to record to the server? So there's this idea of, okay, we want to be able to hack our own consciousness, but we don't want other people to hack our consciousness. And this whole idea of privacy, how do we preserve our right to mental privacy? So this is a very tricky question because there's no clear answer for how we should be treating privacy. So I'll be kind of going over some of the different thinking around that. But also there's been a lot of different either ethical approaches or human rights approaches. And this is just one high level map to kind of think about this as an issue, which is that there's the XR companies, you have the human rights principles, you have the laws, there's a feeding into those companies and you have this ethical design principles, which is, you know, I've been working on a lot of these design principles with the IEEE and, and other just conversations I've been having. But, you know, this is something that is really complicated, and I'll be diving into this here at the end in terms of how do we protect our right to mental privacy? Do we need a new federal privacy law, or is this something that we can trust the companies to be able to do, or is there need to be something that's kind of like a universal human right of privacy? All right, so there's four sections I'm going to go over today. One is just kind of doing an overview of some of the physiological and biometric inputs. I'll be talking a little bit of my own personal journey into covering VR privacy and some of the lessons I've learned along the way. I'll talk about some of the different philosophies of privacy, which there's pretty much one that is used now, but there's other alternatives that are emerging. And then take a look at protecting the right to mental privacy and what that means and how we get there. Now, again, there's a lot of open questions here, but I think this is at least how I've been thinking about it and trying to map out the landscape a little bit. All right, so just last week or so, May 26th, there was this non-invasive neural interfaces conference, which was put on by the Columbia Neural Rights Initiative, as well as Facebook Reality Labs. So it was a day long effort, had all these different neuroscientists coming in, basically showing the state of the art of different brain computer interfaces and neurotechnologies and discussing some of the ethical implications of all this technology. One of the co-organizers, Rafael Yusta, he was a co-author on this paper called It's Time for Neurorights. And it's basically proposing that there should be at least five human rights principles when it comes to neural technologies. One is the right to identity, the right to agency, the right to mental privacy, the right to fair access to mental augmentation, and the right to be protected from algorithmic bias. So these are basic human rights. And how do we enshrine those? Do they need to be like a law? But that's at least one approach. And so, you know, as we gathered together, there was representatives from Facebook Reality Labs, there was different neuroscience researchers. And, you know, what I learned is what Facebook Reality Labs said is that they do multi-stakeholder immersions where they bring in all these different perspectives. This particular conference only had scientists and some ethicists, but basically no privacy advocates, no lawyers. So it was unfortunately not really diving into much of the ethical implications, more of the science applications. So I'm hoping to see much more nuanced discussions about some of the different ethical implications. So here's some highlights in terms of, you know, the different technology that is coming out. You know, there's stuff that's in the medical context. They have the control labs, the EMG, surface level EMG to be able to take a neural input and be able to detect your gestures and do all sorts of other stuff in terms of detecting your emotions and isolating down to individual motor neurons. And then there was OpenBCI who had the Gallia headset and then the kernel flow, which is another brain computer interface 
all this is like consumer technology. Usually we're dealing with medical applications, but this is getting into the area of like taking this data and starting to put it into a consumer context. So what does that mean? So I just wanted to show here this little map from Simon Wardley where he says there's these four phases of technology. There's a genesis of an idea. It's like a duct tape prototype of what's possible. There's a custom built enterprise application, and then there's a consumer product and then into the commodity. So as you can see, you know, a lot of prototypes have been done over the years. Some of those have gone into actually being applications that are used by medical applications. And then now that we're getting into like the next phase of immersive technologies and neurotechnologies, we're starting to integrate a lot of these sensors into consumer products, whereas they've only been available to like doctors before. So again, we're moving through this phase where we're jumping from the custom-built applications in the medical context into the consumer context. So what's it mean to have all these different devices? And I was really struck by some of the new sensors that are in the Gallia. This is actually a collaboration with OpenBCI and Toby as well as Valve. So there's like EOC and EEG and, well, actually, <laughs> I don't know all the precise sensors, but there was enough new sensors like PPG and eye tracking and looking at your temperature that I felt it was time to do a little bit of an audit of all the different stuff that was out there. Well, first, before I do that, there's this interview that I did with this behavioral neuroscientist who had this tour of all the different biometric data streams and the unethical threshold between controlling and predicting behavior. Whereas going from medical context to consumer context, how are we supposed to treat this when it's essentially aiming towards mind reading technology? We're not there yet, but it can essentially decode your brain. It's already threats to mental privacy and it's only going to get better over time. So those threats to our mental privacy are only going to get more intractable over time. So how do we handle all that? Britton Heller has this paper where she's trying to define this concept of biometric psychography. And this is a bit of a paradigm shift when it comes to privacy, because mostly when we think about privacy, we think about it in terms of identity. But biometric psychography is contextually dependent of what is happening in the moment, and it's trying to determine what your emotions are, what you're feeling, and trying to assert different aspects about your essential character based upon what they're observing with these technologies. So here's some list of some of those different physiological and biometric inputs, and I'll, I'll sort of show more of a long list here. I did an audit of just all the different stuff that I could find in terms of on the long trajectory, some of this stuff is going to be integrated into immersive technology. Some of it is just never going to get it, probably just because it's just in hospital and it's not mobile. It's not really consumer technology. It's only really for professional grade for medical doctors. But on the long scale of things, there's a lot more stuff on this list that's going to be integrated into these technologies than not. And so how do you make sense of what this data is and how does it fit into the larger ecosystem? And so this is one visualization, just looking at eye tracking data and being able to track all these different individual aspects, but all the different inferences that you can make in terms of your personality traits, your sexual preferences, and your cognitive load, and some of your mental processes, and different demographic aspects. And so there's just a lot of inferred data that you can get just even from the primary aspects of eye tracking data. And so Britton Heller has introduced this concept of biometric psychography in order to start to describe some of this data. Most of privacy is really focused on identity and personal identifiability of the data. And so this is just a study from Stanford University with Mark Roman Miller and Jeremy Balenson and other researchers be able to take five minutes of 360 video on a sixth off piece of hardware, and they're able to pretty much with over 90% confidence or something super high being able to identify people uniquely by their movements within virtual reality. So you're able to take something like movement and be able to identify it. But again, this is really focused on identifiability. So I'd say that there's this bifurcation between thinking about privacy only in terms of identity. A lot of the research is around trying to take data and, and see if you can identify people. And there's this whole other aspect of the biometric psychographic data, which is much more about your likes, your interests, your preference in the context of what's happening in that moment. So again, this is a shift between something that's static versus dynamic, your identity versus the psychographic profile, the immutable traits versus the something that's transient of your likes and dislikes, something that may be stored forever versus something that may be processed in real time and not even stored. You you have something that's context independent or something that's very really dependent upon the context. And then you have personal identifiable information and then information that's really about your character and personality. So just to kind of unpack this a little bit, you have these other different types of psychographic information that's going to be available. You have, again, this long list of different stuff and these new technologies. This is a graphic from MIT looking at OpenBCI and seeing how there's all this different information and all the different qualitative aspects about what is saying about your arousal, your attention, what you're paying attention to, your level of stress. 
And so there's this quote that Robert McKee talks about, your true character is revealed in the choices that a human being makes under pressure, and the greater the choices that you make, the more that your essential character is being revealed. That's kind of what Facebook and all these technologies may be doing, is trying to reveal our essential character by recording all this data. So you're put into these different situations, you're making choices and taking action, and you're having some aspects of your character revealed. So there's all sorts of different types of your identity in terms of your context of information, your worldview, your beliefs, your demographics of where you live, education, your income, all this stuff. And then there's all the context, context dependent stuff, like being able to get like medical information from all these technologies or information about your friends and who you're associating with. And so what happens to that data? And then there's all sorts of data that is about what's happening in your body and your quality of presence from active presence, mental and social presence, emotional presence, or embodied environmental presence. Specifically, things like your behaviors, your intentions, your actions, your movements, your mental thoughts, your cognitive processes, your cognitive load, your social presence, your affective state, emotional sentiment analysis, facial expressions and micro expressions, your muscle fatigue and body language, eye gaze, attention, physiological reactions, and stress and arousal. All of these things are going to be made available in real time. So what happens to this type of psychographic data? And then you have different ways of being able to extrapolate different aspects of your character based upon they're going to have all this information about your context. And so what happens to that information? Your personality traits that you'll be able to use the big five personality traits or your feelings or your needs. You know, there's all these different vectors of your context, the quality of your experience, your character, your feelings, your needs and personality traits. All these are psychographic data that are going to be made available. So again, what happens in this new paradigm of biometric psychography that goes beyond being able to be personally identifiable? So I'm gonna talk about my personal journey into XR privacy. Started way back in 2016 when there was a couple of articles in Upload VR. This was in April and there was some stuff of like an always on service and then ambiguity and privacy policy. And that got the attention of Senator Al Franklin who sent an inquiry and basically it started this dialogue of the larger XR community starting to talk about privacy and the privacy implications of virtual reality. And this was the next conference was the Silicon Valley Virtual Reality Conference in April 27th to 29th. And there was a buzz about this as a topic and it just came up again and again. I started doing interviews. And since that time, I've done 40 or 50 different interviews specifically focusing on privacy. One of them was Sarah Downey, who was talking about how the third party doctrine, anytime you give data to a third party and they record it on a server, that means the government can have access to it because of the Fourth Amendment and the third party doctrine of the Fourth Amendment means that anytime you give data to a third party, there's no reasonable expectation for it to remain private, which means the government can get access to it without a warrant. So then you have this whole concept of virtual reality surveillance, meaning that anytime that anybody is recording any data on a server, that means it's basically public data, according to the government. They can get access to it. According to the US government, everything in cyberspace is public. It's a public domain. It's like walking down the street, which means that if it's recorded somewhere, the government can get access to it. Then there was the VR Privacy Summit, which happened in November 2018, which I helped organize with Jessica Outlaw and High Fidelity and as well as Jeremy Balancy. And there was a very ambitious, like, we're going to spend eight hours or so with 50 people. And by the end of it, we're going to come up with this bill of rights for what privacy should be. And it was very ambitious because it turned out that privacy is much, much, much more complicated than just getting 50 people in a room for eight hours to be able to figure it out. It's something that we still haven't figured out. I actually went to a, a philosophy conference with one of the founders of philosophy of privacy, and she gave this rousing speech of the philosophy of privacy and digital life, uh, Dr. Anita Allen, in uh, 2019. And she's like, there's no comprehensive philosophical framework for privacy. That doesn't exist. So if there's no comprehensive philosophical framework for privacy, then basically everybody who's dealing with anything with privacy is basically kind of making up as they go along, or they're really looking at the information practice principles from 1973. But we'll get into that. So then I went to Laval Virtual, started to look at different aspects of ethics, and we sort of brainstorm all these different ethical issues, and privacy, of course, was coming up. And then this was from a prior work that I'd done in terms of just mapping out all the different contexts of virtual reality based upon the answer to what is the ultimate potential of VR. I was starting to kind of map up some of these different ethical issues into these different contexts. And it turns out that context is very useful when it comes to looking at both the ethical issues as well as identity, as well as privacy. So there's a high connection to contextual dimensions. So 
I went on and gave a talk about the ethical moral dilemmas of mixed reality, and then went to SIGGRAPH and did a whole panel discussion with different privacy experts and privacy engineers, and then did a whole XR ethics manifesto in November of 2019. And then, you know, this is sort of just like an overview of some of the different issues. There's so many different issues in terms of ethics, but privacy in particular crosses so many of these different domains in terms of yourself, your identity, your, your financial, your private communication, your education information, your home, where you live, your private property, your entertainment, as well as your medical information. So this whole swath of information here that's like kind of private, personally identifiable information. And then I went to Sundance and they had this whole persuasion machines where they basically live streamed me without really doing informed consent. They had me sign some papers and they didn't really tell me that they were going to be live streaming me. And it got me really upset. Like this felt like a transgression of like, yeah, it was a piece of art, but it's really trying to be provocative. And it really did provoke me. And it got me into like digging into lots of different philosophy of privacy aspects. And then I came across this philosophy of privacy conference that had three different philosophers of privacy talking about the different approaches to the philosophy of privacy. So now I'm going to go into the different philosophies of privacy, just to kind of overview some of the different perspectives of privacy. So there's three main takes. So Dr. Adam Moore was talking about the libertarian approach, which is privacy is a property right that can be bought and sold and traded. That's pretty much how we treat it right now, that you can basically sign over consent and form consent, and you can do whatever you want with that data. Helen Niesenbaum has a whole theory of contextual integrity, which is privacy is defined by appropriate information flows that meet specific contextual norms. We'll be diving into exactly what that means, but it's all about the flow of information that is contextually dependent. And then the final from Dr. Anita Allen was about privacy as a human right that needs to be protected by the state. So it's more of a paternalistic approach saying, we're not really responsible enough to take care of our privacy. So we need to like kind of treat it like an organ, like you can't sell your organ. So just the same, maybe we should treat privacy like it's something that you can't just give away or sell or trade. So it's a more paternalistic approach. All right, so getting into the, the libertarian approach, there's a privacy as the control of private information. Alan Weston, his famous privacy and freedom. So this is kind of setting the larger context for the fair and information practice principles. I did a whole interview in episode 951, with 90 minute primer of the history of privacy with Joe Jerome, sort of a great overview of a lot of these different pieces of information. And there's this fair information practice principles that came up in 1973. And that's basically what we have today, which is you have information and as long as you tell other people what to expect in terms of what information they're recording, then everything's okay. That's the FTC comes in and says, you just have to disclose what you're recording. As long as you disclose what you're recording, then we're all cool. So then you have these big, long terms of service and privacy policies that no one really ever really reads. And then you have Dr. Adam Moore saying, well, maybe we should actually treat private data like it's copyright, where you can grant access to it, but you could also revoke access to it if you wanted to. So you have these big, long Oculus data privacy terms of service and privacy policies that no one reads. They're so confusing. And it's like a, a transparency paradox that Helen Eason-Baum talks about where you can either be super high fidelity in terms of really describing it or super general and vague and you're not really understanding what's happening. So either way, it's a terrible situation that we're in in terms of this whole notice and consent model where it basically fails to protect our privacy. It's a ticket that you have to punch in order to get access to the technology. You have to sign the terms of service and the privacy policy. So then you have contextual integrity, which is privacy is the appropriate information flows that meet certain contextual norms. So appropriate flows. So the norms are happening within a certain context and legitimate, worth defending, and morally justifiable. So it's a little bit of a different paradigm that we haven't really fully seen implemented. So some of this is still philosophical, but I think it's worth pointing to because I think for me, it's one of the most robust approaches. Like you don't want to just cut off all BCI information because there are aspects of that that are medical information that are contextually relevant. So you want your doctor to have access to it. So it's appropriate for your doctor to have access to it. So it's all about appropriate flow of who the stakeholders are. So you have to define the context and who the stakeholders are. So you're defining those context. So the social spheres defined by important purposes, goals, and values is how Nissenbaum defines it. And for me, I started to talk about these domains of human experience in these contexts and start to map out. Again, this sort of reflects different aspects of our identity and privacy, as well as ethical issues that come up. But there's different stakeholders. So the subject and sender and the recipient, and you're basically sending information to different types of information. And then there's different ways in which it's appropriate. So what's appropriate mean? Well, that's legitimate and worth defending and moral justifiable. There's a, probably a lot of stuff that if people really knew all the different biometric data that was being recorded, they'd probably object and saying, hey, you know, I didn't really necessarily think that you're going to be like storing all this information or using it for this context. 
So how to match up this tsunami of information based upon, is it appropriate? Is it contextually appropriate? That's the challenge. So Nissenbaum's contextual integrity is providing a, a new pathway, but this has basically not been implemented yet in a robust way in our laws. So we're still in that first model from a libertarian approach. Now, a third approach is that privacy should be a human right and it needs to be protected by the state. Now, this gets into like treating it like as an organ, like you'd be prevented from doing certain aspects, but maybe you want to be able to hack your own consciousness, you want access to it, but this type of approach may prevent you from having that. But at the same time, if you do nothing, then you basically have society where there's no privacy and it's like a dystopian state, which is already happening. So maybe you need to like have some dimension of this. So that's sort of the argument for a paternalistic approach when there's different approaches that Raphael used to start to talk about. A lot of these are paternalistic approaches, like only using it for scientific or medical uses or authorizing the buying and selling or treating it like brain data that has different restrictions, like as if it was a body organ or treating it like genetic data or medical data or this fifth option, which is the libertarian approach, which is basically you can do whatever you want with the existing system, which Raphael sees would be a bad idea. So these are the three different options. And we're kind of like navigating which one are we going to do. Like I said, we're here in the libertarian approach, but there's these other alternatives that are worth considering. So just as a final wrap up here, and I just want to go through this quickly because I'm sort of running out of time, but you just look at the different aspects of nested contexts and to see how there's a contextual dimension of the culture within the context of laws, within the context of economy and the design guidelines, and then the technological architecture and the code. You can do it from a Loris and Lessig sort of all these different vectors, or you can look at, at these nested contexts. So you have the culture, laws, economy, design guidelines, user experience, app code, OS code, and hardware and technology. So again, going back to this, you have the human rights that are feeding into laws, the laws are feeding into the different ethical design principles. But here you have the companies are surrounded by the hardware. In order for users to get access, they have to sign the terms of service. That's basically the get out of jail free card to do whatever they want. So basically they could monetize their biometric data if they wanted to, they can have contextually aware AI. They have some restrictions over the third party developers, but we have to come in here to the side with these ethical design principles that are informing either a new federal privacy law or being able to come up with other human rights principles to be able to feed into this larger ecosystem that's gonna shift this larger dynamic, saying, hey, this is a fundamental human right that needs to be taken into consideration by all levels of how it's implemented. There's no answer to this. So all this stuff that's read is undetermined. Like Facebook tomorrow can monetize all this data and there's no recourse because of the terms of service and how this is all set up. So going back to the neuro rights, the right to identity, agency, mental privacy, and for access to mental augmentation, and the right to be protected from algorithmic bias. The human rights approach is a big hot topic. We'll be talking about this at RightsCon, trying to explore different human rights approaches to these different topics. And yeah, that's kind of an overview of the different biometric inputs, the my journey into VR privacy, some of the different philosophical approaches to privacy, as well as being able to protect our right to mental privacy. So again, my name is Kent Bai, the Voices of VR podcast. And Thanks for joining me here. And I'm going to go watch the F8 keynote, which I think is starting right now. So thank you, everybody.